Did you know that Crime After Crime ranks in the top 50 documentary podcasts in several countries in the world? I'm not surprised. I love documentaries. It's fun to learn while you're being entertained and dive into topics you're truly passionate about. Wouldn't it be great if there was a streaming service that focused on that type of content? Guess what? It's here. Today's YouTube version of Crime After Crime is sponsored by Magellan TV. Magellan TV is founded by filmmakers with a passion for producing and curating the best documentary content out there. Documentaries on history, science, space, nature, and of course, true crime. It's all waiting for you on Magellan TV. Can a parachute be used as a murder weapon? Check out Parachute Murder Plot. It absolutely blew my mind. Killer in the Family offers a perspective not often seen. It's a fascinating look into families of murderers that will make you think twice. Magellan TV works on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, iOS. You can watch it on your TV, laptop, or mobile device anytime, anywhere. With more than 2,000 documentaries and new content being added weekly, including 4K content at no additional cost, why wouldn't you give Magellan TV a shot? And Crime After Crime viewers can try it out for free. Visit MagellanTV.com forward slash crime after crime and you'll get a one month free trial. There is nothing to lose. Give Magellan TV a try for free and thank them for supporting crime after crime at the same time. Visit MagellanTV.com forward slash crime after crime today. Thank you, Magellan TV. Now let's get to the show. Hey everyone, it's John Lorden. And me, Daniel Hallen. I'm singing again. I do this every time. Well, sing, sing a holiday <laughs> song, why don't you? It's December. Oh my goodness. If any of you could have seen me getting ready in my bathroom earlier, I did. I had some good Michael Buble going, Frank Sinatra, all the good classic Christmas music. Nice. I was singing. Will I ever do that for you guys? <clears throat> I don't know if I really want to scar you like that. <laughs> Maybe you should start another YouTube channel and just post all that stuff over there. Um, yes, welcome to the Crime After Crime Holiday Spectacular. Oh, I'm excited. This is one of my favorite times of year. Yes. Yeah, mine too. Hopefully today doesn't destroy anyone's opinions of jolly old St. Nick. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Yeah, he he might uh, get a ding or two in his reputation after these stories that we cover. But um, yep, we've got a lot to talk to you guys about. Before we get to that, I just want to uh, say, Danielle, I'm finally on the in crowd. <gasps> Yay! Oh my goodness! Yeah, look, you can see BB-8 in the reflection of my I can, perfectly. Yeah, YouTube silver button. <laughs> oh my goodness! I made it. I'm so happy. Yeah, oh. yeah. Did I really, it take that long to get there? To uh, get to you know, you? I actually had to contact them and say, oh, "Hey, can I you guys? Yeah, can you take a look at my channel and see if I'm good for this?" And uh, the support was really responsive. Like they kept up to date. Like it took three or four days and every day I'd get a message from them. Hey, we're looking, you know, just sit tight. Uh, and then they approved it. They sent me the code and I ordered it. And I think I had it like a week later. It came really, really fast after they approved it. I just wasn't sure because, um, it's weird when, you know, you put out content and you like get demonetized kind of regularly and you're like, are they trying to get rid of this type of content on their platform? Are they not going to support us? Yeah. It's such a weird relationship and I've been working with them for years that I didn't know if I should let my expectations get to the point of me really banking on this happening, even though you got yours and I, I knew yes. you got yours. I just had no idea if it was going to come through or not, but it feels really good. I'm really, really happy that they did. I know. It's exciting. I will never forget when I got mine, um, like what, two months ago? <laughs> yeah. Yep. I waited way too long to order mine. I'm about to hit 400,000. <laughs> yeah. They need to send you three more. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. But yeah, it is. It's it's one of those moments. I actually remember perfectly how I felt. I was excited to get mine. It's a huge accomplishment, but I'm also like, I try to be like kind of a modest person, even like with myself. Yeah. Yeah. But I will never forget, like I got it and my heart like started racing and I had butterflies and then I opened it up and I was like, this is absolutely 
unreal. It's crazy. It's a huge milestone. You work hard to get there. Yeah. You know, yeah. you have so many people that are supporting you. That's a large number of people. Imagine being in a room with that many people. Seriously. Yeah, seriously. That's a it's that's crazy. a coliseum or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it also came with a really nice letter from the CEO, which I thought was really well done and a really yeah. nice uh, way of writing it as well. All right. But that's not what you guys are here for. You're here for crime <laughs> after crime. This is a podcast. It's not a YouTube channel. So let's move it along. Um, if you would like to vote vote on today's episode of Crime After Crime, you can do that at our Twitter account, at Crime After Pod, and that'll be available for seven days after the episode launches, or... You guys can also vote on YouTube. All you have to do is hover your mouse over the screen if you're on a laptop or just kind of press your finger on the screen if you're on a smartphone and a little eye will appear in the corner. Hit that sucker, vote for who you think brought the best story. It's as easy as that. All right, and now it is time for... Voting results with Danielle for the last episode, Craigslist Crimes. That was a really fun episode. I really enjoyed that, that one. That was fun. The research was definitely very difficult. Yeah. And I appreciate our kind of the way we went with it. But you guys, on Twitter, I received 37% of the votes and John whooped my butt with 63%. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I know. They loved your story. You're, it was a good one. I'm not even going to sit here and deny it. I was beside myself. Yeah. <laughs> and then on YouTube, pretty much the same, 35% for me and 65% of the votes for John, which means so far, that's one win for me and two for John. So at this point... Unless something changes today, I'm pretty positive his season of revenge isn't a joke. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. It's it, maybe it's more like a seesaw of revenge because <laughs> it Just seems keep me dangling and like unsure. Yeah, it seems of, to of go back and forth. And you seem pretty confident about today's story before we started recording. So I do, but I'm yeah. gonna hand over your cup. All right, let's do it. Let me I'll, have it. I'll give it back. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. And what did You're she put welcome. in it this time? Straight, Some... straight vodka. Okay, yes. great. <laughs> well, I already went Thanksgiving shopping. I've got a whole bunch, you know, of liquor hanging out around my house. I was like, you know what? Maybe if I get him <laughs> drunk enough, he'll forget to read half of the story and then I'll win. There you go. That's a, that's a great strategy. I like that. Logic. Uh, you Logic. Know, let me just say, I was thinking about it earlier today and how often we go back and forth in terms of winning. I'm yeah. so happy we're not really sending a mug across the U.S. I know. over and over. <laughs> I know. Could you imagine? Yeah, we wouldn't be able to afford doing this show anymore if we had to actually send the mug. I know. It does. It goes back and forth so often, like almost perfectly. We've each had, I think, like one streak. Yeah. Only one. Yeah. But that's only one in like the past year. I know. How we managed to do this, it's absolutely beyond me. Yeah. It's crazy. It's like a it's it's like a prize fight, man. It's a slug out. <laughs> Just one big story after another. Yep. Speaking of, I think it's time, Danielle. What do you think? I think it's time too. I am so ready for this. I found the best story. All Not right. to toot my own horn or anything. Yeah, no, no, no. She's like, I'm telling you guys, she's confident. She's confident. <laughs> this is the topic Santa Claus crimes, and this is Danielle's story. So today's crime is known as one of the most infamous crimes in Texas. So we already know the story starting off great. Texas, crazy things happen. Mm -hmm. Santa's loved by many, and he's known to bring children joy and gifts. But in this story, Santa brought fear instead of gifts and robbed instead of giving. Uh oh. Exactly. 24-year-old Marshall Ratliff was a career criminal even at his young age, and he seemed to leave chaos in his wake wherever he went. He had grown up in Cisco, Texas, committing all sorts of crimes with his brother Lee. So this isn't just like simple childhood sibling craziness. They were you know, bad criminals. Mm -hmm. And just prior to the robbery I'll be speaking about today, Marshall and his brother had been arrested and sentenced to 18 years in prison for a bank robbery they committed in 1926 in Valera, Texas. Now, their mother appealed to Governor Miriam Ferguson, who was known for pardoning, get this, 4,000 convicts. What? In her two short terms. <laughs> Wow. They do everything was, big in Texas. Exactly. And wow. she was known for this. So their mother went and plead to her to get them out early. Again, 18 years is a long time. They're 24 years old. Sure. And just as planned, Governor Ferguson let both young men go after barely serving one year out of the 18. That's insane. Exactly. How does that happen? 
Wow. But instead of taking this opportunity, as hopefully most would, to set themselves straight, they started to plan another robbery in their own hometown of Cisco the second they were released in early December of 1927. Now, this, for obvious reasons, was risky in itself, but even more so because <laughs> recent actions the Texas Bankers Association had to take. This will tell you the time period. So during this time period, Texas was thriving. So there were at least three to four bank robberies a day. And unable Whoa. to control them, the association offered a $5,000 reward to anyone that shot a bank robber to stop them. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a second. <laughs> yes. Hold on a second. So they're offering the general public $5,000 yes. to shoot a bank robber. Yes. So if I want to murder someone, I could just take them to the bank, <laughs> grab a sack, shoot them. And be like, they did it. <laughs> yeah. Stuff the sack in their hand and say, oh, yeah, no, they told me they were going to rob this place. Exactly. Because wow. this location at the time, they were thriving. It was you know, known for oil at this period in time. I think sure. today, Cisco only has about 3,000 residents. But back then, it had uh, like over 10,000 residents. Okay. So the bank being robbed so frequently, all the banks in the area, it was a huge problem. And $5,000 back then would equal to about $70,000 today. So wow. this was a huge incentive, but this didn't scare Marshall or Lee away in the slightest, which <sighs> doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Marshall and Lee were creating a plan to rob Cisco First National Bank. They had majority of the plan together, but Lee ended up being arrested right before the execution, so Marshall had to find a few new partners. His two first picks were 21-year-old Bob Hill and 32-year-old Henry Helms. Both of these men Marshall had met while in jail, and Henry Helms, in particular, had also been released early thanks to Governor Ferguson. I'm telling you. <laughs> wow. But they still needed someone who would be good at cracking a safe. So Henry Helms suggested a relative of his that was in need. 33-year-old Louis Davis. He didn't have a criminal record, but Henry believed he would do the trick. So after offering a large amount of money as compensation, the four began to finish the plans of the heist. Now, the robbery would be tricky. From the new reward, obviously, to many Cisco residents as well as law enforcement being very familiar with Marshall's face since it was his hometown. Mm -hmm. He knew he would be recognized immediately as being a known troublemaker, so he needed to figure out some sort of disguise, but not one that would alert anyone to trouble. Being December, near Christmas, Marshall thought a Santa suit would do just the trick. Not only would it fit perfectly into the holidays, but everyone trusted Santa, so it hopefully would also make things much easier. Marshall managed to find a friend that had a Santa suit and asked to borrow it. So with the disguise figured out, Santa and his three elves stole their getaway car in Wichita Falls, about 150 miles away from where they were planning on robbing the bank. They had been staying there to plan everything, and they headed off to Cisco. <clears throat> I know. It's crazy. So they arrived on the morning of December 23rd. And Marshall was dropped off blocks away from the bank, and he casually began to walk down Main Street in the Santa suit, while the other men went to an alley behind the bank to wait for him. Now, Marshall's goal was to seem as normal as possible to not throw off any red flags. And in order to do that, he needed to look like he belonged. So to help the authenticity of his disguise, he smiled ear to ear was waving to everyone on the streets, stopped and spoke to multiple children, asked them what they wanted for Christmas. He had everyone in this gigantic Christmas spirit of just happiness all the way down Main Street. And then once he was done, he decided to meet the other men in the alley. And even still, he was being followed by children oh walking God. into this alley. All these kids were excited. They were seeing him. Their parents were shopping. They're seeing Santa. And they're like, oh my gosh, mom, hold on. I'm going to go talk to Santa. They were hoping to get in these last minute wishes. Yeah. Wow. So Marshall entered the Cisco First National Bank and was given a warm greeting of Hello Santa by Alex Spears, who was the front cashier. While Alex expected a jolly greeting in return, that isn't at all what happened. Instead, Marshall, in his red suit, his beard, and his hat, walked right past the cashier and was quickly followed by three men. Alex again attempted to greet this person dressed as Santa, but as soon as the words came out, Bob Hill pulled a weapon and pointed the pistol and screamed, hands up. Mm. Henry and Lewis simultaneously pulled out their weapons, and Santa pushed his way through the swinging employee door and sneakily retrieved the gun that was typically used to guard the bank. Marshall pulled out his own Santa sack, which was actually just a potato sack, and ordered <laughs> the teller to fill it and open the vault. Now, Bob, Henry, and Lewis continued to use their weapons to keep the customers and employees cooperative, but nobody had really taken into account that other children 
might still try to find Santa to tell them their wish list. No, 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 no. I know. <clears throat> this is exactly what happened. Because, of course, a six-year-old little girl named Frances had seen Santa walking down Main Street, but her mother was shopping at the time and she couldn't go up and say anything to him. So she begged her mother to help her go find Santa and they found out that he was at the bank, but they had absolutely no idea the reality of what they were walking into. The moment they walked into the bank was the exact same moment that all the men were drawing their weapons. Mm. So the girl's mother immediately began to drag her to the back of the bank. The men saw this happening and they began to panic and they were yelling at her to stop. And she is like superwoman because she ignored them yelling at her, continued to just drag her daughter across the floor. This woman knocked down a door and then ran into the alley screaming that a robbery was taking place. Wow. That's wow. some bravery. Yeah. <laughs> like that's and, some and serious some bravery. Yeah. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. So those words and the reward offered by the Texas Bankers Association were all it took for every shopkeeper, citizen, police officer, anyone nearby to grab their guns and run to the bank. The entire bank was surrounded instantly. Yeah, she basically came out and yelled, hey, $5,000 is over here waiting for you. Exactly, Whoa. exactly. Wow. So at this point, Santa and his elves realized they were in trouble. And in a panic, they began to fire at the angry mob outside of the bank. And this started a full shootout. I'm talking back and forth. Everyone is just shooting at each other. Wow. So all four of the men wildly shot their guns while running to the back of the bank in hopes of escaping into their car, but not before taking 12-year-old Laverne and 10-year-old Emma May from the bank with them as hostages. They threw the young girls in the car along with Lewis, who ended up being shot, was very badly wounded, and they drove off as fast as possible, but they had 1,000 plus people. <laughs> In pursuit, wow. <laughs> chasing this man in a Santa suit. Bullets were raining down on the car, but the men kept driving as fast as they could. And finally, by the edge of town, they realized they needed to ditch the car. They hadn't thought to fill it up with gas <laughs> while creating their master plan. And they were running dangerously low. They weren't fully out yet. It was just getting too close for comfort. And on top of that, all their tires had been shot all of them were mostly flat. So they get out and they frantically attempted to wave down another vehicle and a family driving an Oldsmobile happily pulled over to help Santa, unaware of the situation. It's so sick to me that ah, someone, I'm telling you, they, they were right. People trust Santa. If you see a Santa on the side of the road waving at you, it looks maybe in distress. People, especially with children, are going to want to pull over, which is exactly what happened. The 14-year-old child of the family was driving the car, and he said he wanted to pull over and help Santa until they go to help and were forced out of the vehicle. Mm. The family ran off to escape, and the men began to transfer everything into the new car, all while dodging bullets, because there are still 1,000 angry people determined to get $5,000 chasing them. Right. But they quickly realized they themselves had been bamboozled. The 14-year-old boy that had been driving thought quickly and took the keys with him before the family ran off. This is like, there are so many bad decisions happening in this story. Because even oh. that, you know, um, you're, you're not giving them what they want. Your yep. family's with you. Yeah, you mm -hmm. take the keys and, and you kind of outsmart them a little bit. But where are you when they figure that out? How far from the car could you possibly be? Oh, definitely, not, definitely not very far. Yeah, not far <laughs> enough. It might have been better to actually leave the keys in the car and to let them just go. go. I mean, just just to protect yourself and your family. Yep. Um, I mean, I, I kind of get where he's coming from. And I'm also wondering, maybe was it just a natural reaction? Was he just possibly, you know, sometimes when I stop the car, I don't even think about it. And the keys come out and go in my pocket. So yep. it's. Um, wow. Wow. A lot of, and then the, the terrible decision about the $5,000 payment for catching a bank robber. I mean, look at what happened. Uh, it's, oh, it gets even crazier. Don't worry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, so infuriated now that they cannot start this car, mm -hmm. they throw the girls back into the original getaway car. They leave Lewis behind because he was slowing them down and they take off. But guess what they forgot in the Oldsmobile? <laughs> No, Danielle, don't tell me. Don't tell Santa me they forgot, forgot the money. Santa forgot his sack full of money. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Hold on. I was just talking about bad decisions. <laughs> Are you kidding me? They left I the mean, sack. Yes, they did. And not only did they get back in their car, they knew they had no gas in. Instead of continuing out of town, they went back to Main Street. To the gas station. 
they basically drove straight towards all of these people that were... <laughs> I don't know. And then they kind of went a different direction out of town and they only made it a mile out before the car really did fully run out of gas. And they had to think at this point of another escape plan. So they left both of the girls horrified in the backseat of the car and they took off on foot. Santa's still in his costume. I can only imagine how absolutely ridiculous this looked. And authorities at this point are now hot on their trail. They first found Lewis, who was taken to Fort Worth Hospital to be treated for his wounds. He did later succumb to them. I've actually seen a picture of him in the hospital. Yeah. Um, they then found the getaway car with the two terrified girls still in the back seat, as well as all of the money that had been taken from the bank. Mm. It totaled to $12,000 in cash, plus $150,000 in non-negotiable securities. Wow. Wow. For back then, that's a haul. That's what I'm. That's why everyone was robbing all these banks because yeah. everything was doing so well. Wow! <laughs> and they left all that money behind, so the money was in fact given back to the bank. But it actually took days for them to find Marshall, Henry, and Bob. Mm. So it went from not now not only being like the most infamous bank robbery in Texas to being one of the largest manhunts still to date in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Authorities and concerned citizens alike piled in their cars rode horseback, or roughed it on foot to search for the men. They kept finding clues like bloodstained rags, cotton, and gauze, indicating that the men were at the very least wounded. However, at some point, the men were no longer on foot. They ended up taking a vehicle driven by a young man named Carl Wiley, and they also took him to hold hostage. Now, his dad had actually been in the car, too, and was trying to shoot the men away, basically to scare them, and he ended up shooting his own son. Oh. He survived. He survived. He's oh. fine. I just want to say that. But he ended up shooting his own son trying to get these men away. Yeah, it's wow. scary. So they decided they needed to lie low. So they took the hostage and the car to hide out overnight, thinking things would calm down. But that's not what happened, because as soon as morning broke, they were ambushed by a sheriff in the town of South Bend. They had been attempting to cross a local river to further themselves from the crime when officers on the hunt for them approached. Again, this reward goes to anyone, everyone, everywhere. Everyone was looking. Now, when they saw these officers approaching them from up the road, they were very obvious, backed the car up, didn't even at first turn around. They threw the sucker in reverse and just started flying backwards and then eventually turned around and a car chase ensued. Now, this chase ended at a local oil field where the men again attempted to escape on foot, but the local deputy sheriff managed to come and stop that. Now, the full story behind that, I don't have time for just because, you know, we're on a limited time here, but it yeah. is hilarious. This sheputy, sheputy, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> this deputy sheriff had a double barrel rifle. It had a nickname. This man has like survived so many other crazy things. And he remembered getting out of the car and telling himself, I cannot miss because if I run out of bullets trying to get these men and miss, they're going to come back to get me. So he was like, all right, well, shoot them or right. I die. And that's exactly what he did. Wow. He hit every single one of them on his first attempt. Now, he fully brought down Marshall, who he was able to capture. He hit the other two, but they were just wounded and they managed to still get away, but not for long. They ended up being captured on December 30th in Graham, Texas, after attempting to find shelter at a local rooming house, but the people in the rooming house saw their guns and called police. So all of them ended up being captured, but it took one of the largest manhunts in Texas to find them. I think they brought in even airplanes, which was not very common, and dogs. I mean, everyone and their mother was out on their horse <laughs> yeah. looking for all these men. Now, Henry was taken to trial and formally identified as one, the one in the group that ended up ending the lives of two officers during the shootout at the bank. Mm. And this made a lot of people very upset. So he ended up being executed on September 6th, 1929. Okay. This happened in 1927. That happened pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Just definitely. Saying. Well, it wouldn't uh, happen that way nowadays, that's for sure. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, Bob ended up pleading guilty, and he was sentenced to 99 years in prison, where, this is interesting, he somehow managed to escape three times, but he was always recaptured. But then he ended up only serving until about the 40s Yeah. when he was paroled, and he actually came out, changed his name, turned his life around, never got into any criminal trouble again, and then passed away in 96 from natural causes. Wow. 
Wow. What is <laughs> what is up with getting out of prison? <laughs> out I don't there. know. That's insane. And I know. And then Marshall, a.k.a. Santa, mm -hmm. who received 99 years in prison as well. Now, one of the girls that were taken as a hostage, I think it was Emma May, she was able to identify him as the one wearing the Santa suit because... When they got in the car, he actually ripped off his hat and his beard. Yeah. Uh, but the problem is that nobody from the bank saw his face. So this costume actually worked perfectly. So they, this is kind of why the punishment seems a lot less than expected because no one knew who was in this Santa suit other than this young girl. And then obviously the people that captured him um, and no one really saw him shoot a gun that no one could say for sure. So they weren't really able to pin him with a lot, but everyone was infuriated with this and they wanted him punished for the deaths of the officers as well. Uh, however, the system wasn't moving fast enough. They ended up saying he needed to be executed after a whole uproar from the community. But when word got out after a while that he hadn't been executed yet, another community uproar began. Uh oh, now, he's during... not going to get pardoned, is he? <clears throat> uh, oh, no. <laughs> okay. This is Texas 1927. Well, yeah, but come on. We had 4,000 people get pardoned. He could oh, be 4,001. But thankfully, oh it doesn't go that way. No, okay. no, not here. So okay. during this uproar, Marshall made people that much more angry because People were coming outside of the jail and they were rioting. They were saying, this man, you know, you said you were going to execute him. He needs to be executed. And during this time, he actually tricked two guards into thinking he was paralyzed. Okay. He, like, had this thing while he was in prison where he tried to, like, plead insanity and all these things by, like, acting crazy. He just did the absolute most to trick people. And somehow it always worked, which just like blows my mind. But wow. he tricked them into thinking he was paralyzed. They would help him eat and bathe and go to the bathroom. And it kind of loosened, I guess you could say, uh, his monitoring because they didn't think he was going to go anywhere. And because of this, he ended up managing to grab a gun. He ended up ending the life of one of the guards and was attacking the other one. Whoa. All while the rioting mob that wanted him dead watched through the jail windows. Wow. Now, luckily, uh -oh. the guard handed his booty to him, knocked him unconscious and threw him back in the cell. All right. But <laughs> exactly. I was like, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, but the public was not letting it go that easily. So they ended up overpowering the guard. And in the end, Marshall received the execution punishment after citizens took matters into their own hands. And the heist ended up being dubbed the Santa Claus bank robbery. There's actually a painting of the robbery, which I find strange. And I'm really curious as to what it looks like. And wow. it's, it's it's hanging in the bank. The bank has since moved location. So it's in a new building, but they still have this painting of the robbery up in it. And then the original location of the bank, there is a giant plaque, which I actually have seen a picture of um, to commemorate what happened. I think there were six fatalities in all, um, but absolutely insane yeah and crazy that the public basically took the law into their own hands but i think it's still another statement about that bad policy of kind of like i know hey we need the public's help so we're going to pay you guys to shoot anyone that's robbing a bank and you get them engaged in law enforcement in a bit of a different and maybe not so smart way uh and then you have this guy that's basically become a public figure because that yep. would instantly your notoriety would just shoot through the roof when you have a policy like that. Yep. Then you have him kill one of the guards in jail. I mean, I can see how they felt angry and empowered to the point of wanting to take action when they thought that justice wasn't going to show up after all that. Um, oh, yeah. And then most of them, you know, they were around for searching for them. They were, you know, spent hours on horseback and on foot searching the right. middle of nowhere. Um, yeah. they even, I mean, they have a picture of all the people that were involved in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks, I don't even, I don't even know how to describe it. Like they literally got all these people back together again after the fact. And we're like, all right, everyone smile. Wow. <laughs> and there's this giant, I'm serious. There's this picture online. I'll send it to you, John. Maybe you can flash it or something, yeah. Yeah. but of just everyone that was involved, there's children. I mean, it's. I mean, a whole you know, there's other world. Yeah, I mean, but there's also definitely a a certain part of the culture that's going exactly. to appreciate or, you know, I don't want to say look up to people that commit these these type of robberies, but 
Um, sometimes there's things that you find in those stories where it's like, wow, that's kind of admirable. Or like when we're talking about DB Tuber and we're like, yeah. wow, that was kind of brilliant for him to do it that way. Um, and to, to the point, I mean, these people are becoming famous at that mm -hmm. point. There's like a, a certain level of fame that kind of kicks in around all this also. Do they deserve it? Probably not. Um, but when you become a public figure like that and then you piss off the public, I guess bad things can happen. I think mm -hmm. is the moral of that story. I know. It's just so crazy. And uh, just everything about this was just so insane to me when I was looking into it. And I found it so fascinating how the Santa costume ended up tying into how he was actually charged and what they were able to do. Because, I mean, there's obviously this very basic aspect of it where we're like, oh, that's so silly to wear Santa costume, right. you know, to a robbery and all that, but not a single person could recognize him, which is bizarre to me and insane and how it ended up working out in his favor. But then they were just like, eh, that's I mean, what's yeah, weird. screw it. We'll still, we'll still execute you anyways. Yeah. But that's kind of weird too. Yeah. Like you wonder if he had the uh, Santa outfit, if they would have been like, uh, okay, we're just going <laughs> to, I mean, it seems like there's all these points where the Santa outfit keeps helping him in ways that you really can't anticipate. Um, like there's, you know, I don't know, like goodwill stuck in the yeah. suit. It's crazy. I know it's, it is. Oh, my goodness. And then the thought that he put into, you know, walking down the street yeah. to say hello to the children. I mean, because I will say maybe obviously it was a very different time back then. But if I were like in any public place and a Santa Claus walked in, maybe it's just me doing what I do. But I'd instantly be like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm questioning whatever you're doing right now. <laughs> like I'm analyzing you. Top to bottom, front to back, like I am watching your move. Oh, I'm but, sure as a mother, even you're making sure to give uh, mall yep. Santas kind of a, a good look over before. Oh boy, we don't go to those. <laughs> really? You just don't go at all? <laughs> no, we don't. Yeah. Oh well, my goodness. I, my children are terrified anyways. Actually, yeah. my daughter will probably be fine now, but my son, ooh, he likes to look from afar mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. about it. He yeah. doesn't trust anyone either. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe he gets that for me. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want a picture of him sitting in Santa's lap looking terrified like everyone oh else has of their kids. I have the perfect one of Raylan, which sounds terrible. I, I did not mean to scare her. She was fine when I sat her in his lap. She has gone one time, two times, one time. I don't remember exactly, but yeah. I put her in this man's lap and she was fine. And I thought she was going to smile. And then all of a sudden they took the picture right when she just like her face totally changed and she just was screaming <laughs> oh my goodness you're gonna have to send me a copy of that too i'm gonna i'm gonna have to see that one for myself and she's she's very proud of it she thinks it's the funniest thing to this day i'm sure she does <laughs> i don't know she's oh my goodness she's like this is hilarious why was i so scared i'm like honey your guess is as good as mine <laughs> but i'm telling all you all right Crazy. Well, yeah. Um, once again, we, we find that this happens frequently. Uh, when we go off and research our separate cases, sometimes there's themes that seem to run together. And today, uh, I don't think it's going to be any exception. Some very similar themes going on in my story. But before we get to that, we've got to take a short break. We'll be right back. With a family of four and a full-time career, I don't always have time to get to the grocery store. HelloFresh delivers a box right to your door with step-by-step -step recipes and pre-measured ingredients, everything I need to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. I'm not a great cook, Danielle, but HelloFresh keeps it simple. I've made healthy farro bowls and even a tasty risotto. By far, these are the best dishes I've ever made. Just ask my wife. We had a delicious Gouda pork burger, and it was great knowing they kept my allergies in mind and out of my meals. Yeah, I'm also a vegetarian, and guess what? They've got us covered. They want to make your life easier, so they keep it very flexible. Easily change your delivery days, food preferences, and even skip a week whenever you need. HelloFresh has an amazing offer for our listeners. For a limited time only, get nine free meals with HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com forward slash crime after crime nine and enter crime after crime nine and you'll get nine free meals. Hold on. So you're saying for a limited time only, our listeners can get nine free meals with HelloFresh by going to HelloFresh.com forward slash crime after crime nine and entering code crime after crime nine. That's right. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and eating out far too often. Try HelloFresh today. 
Welcome back. And please support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. Absolutely. Now. And let me let me just say before you do the intro. Yes. Um, I just want to give an extra special shout out because Danielle really does love HelloFresh. We were literally talking about it before. <laughs> I know. As we sat down to film, I freaked out for a second because I saw the uh, like fridge truck. I don't know what to describe it as. I sound so <laughs> dumb right now. But the HelloFresh fridge yeah, truck. <laughs> it backed right on up and I was like, yes, my HelloFresh is here. I actually had HelloFresh for dinner last night and had the leftovers for lunch. I really am a serious fan. Awesome. It, helps me so much. And by the way, I don't know their exact name, but I think they're like the enchiladas, the green salsa, the salsa verde enchiladas. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. in their hall of fame. Do not miss it. If you guys got HelloFresh, if you're using that code and that's on your option, wow, do not miss it. It's probably hands down at this point, one of my favorite meals. You know, she's a fan when she talks about the hall of fresh hall of fame <laughs> or the HelloFresh <laughs> hall of fame. Yeah, I sure do. I'm not kidding. It's my favorite. <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Go ahead and throw the intro. <laughs> All right. So now, after my story. Which was a great story, let me say. I'm going to say that for myself, too. I'm actually really proud of that one. It was. That one's hands down one of my favorite favorites that I've looked into. Yeah. Let's see what kind of Santa John's bringing to the table. All right. Well, this is a story that I like to call Santa's Vacation. 1970. Southington is a town in Hartford County, Connecticut, where Jeffrey R. Stenner grew up. He was described by high school classmates as bright, witty, and good-hearted. Several of his friends came to parties at his home after his family added a pool. He lived there with his two sisters, mother and father. Though Jeffrey really enjoyed reading and did well when he applied himself, friends say he fell just a little short of being a true leader and he wasn't necessarily into academics. As a matter of fact, Jeffrey would drop out of Southington High School during his senior year, but in the yearbook, there's an odd statement about his life goal next to the photo of him. It states, to commit the perfect crime. It doesn't. Oh my goodness, wow. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't say to commit the perfect crime dressed as Santa Claus, but that might have been a little too on the nose. You can't uh, give away too much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, foreshadowing, foreshadowing. Okay. <laughs> After high school, Jeffrey went into the Air Force but was discharged when his father passed away suddenly so he could tend to his grieving mother. He moved to nearby New Britain, Connecticut and got married to his high school sweetheart. After taking some community college classes, Jeffrey eventually found work in banking. He would rise through the ranks to become a manager at Connecticut National Bank, but his first marriage would end. He wound up marrying a co-worker and they had three children together. Eventually, Jeffrey made an impulsive decision and left his banking career behind. He bought a bar called Zindy's and soon after launched another bar called Bankers, and that's with a Q. Bankers was an obvious nod to his previous career and likely a notice to the nearby industry he wanted to attract his clients. It might also be an indicator of something he seemed very focused on, money. Uh -huh. Now. We're yeah, <laughs> we're warming up, Danielle. Uh, now, working in the bar industry, Jeffrey became friendly with a bouncer and bartender named Robert Schmidt, a muscular guy who knew how to handle himself. A little too big to be an elf, but he'll do. Jeffrey convinced Robert to get another job working as a guard for Loomis, an armored truck company that handles large amounts of cash for businesses and banks. Things were initially going well with the two bar businesses until the economy started to turn in the late 80s. Soon Jeffrey had bills mounting and his marriage falling apart. Maybe not so coincidentally, a Loomis company armored truck, which just happened to have his friend Robert working as a guard, also just happened to be robbed in March of 1987. The armed thieves got away with over $1 million. It was the second largest robbery in the state during the 1980s. Jeffrey continued running his businesses and found a new love who became his third wife. Her name was Jill St. John, who he had originally met when he was a banker, but was now working in one of his bars. Jill would keep stacks of money in her apartment. Occasionally, Jeffrey would ask her to bring some of it to his business but the stacks were dwindling. Mm, interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pretty pretty cool life this guy's put together, huh? <laughs> oh, my, yeah. My businesses aren't doing great. I've got a buddy that works for an armored truck company. Need a little cash infusion? 
Got a oh girlfriend. Keep it at her house. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, on December 20th, 1988, a bright Tuesday morning, just after 9 a.m., a Dunbar armored truck was pulling up to United Bank for a routine cash pickup. The bank was already open and there were several customers inside. A guard got out of the truck, went inside and picked up two bags of cash. He put them on a cart and headed back towards the armored truck. But in the parking lot, the door of a brown Volkswagen Jetta opened and Santa Claus stepped out. I guess, <laughs> yeah, I guess Santa brought the Jetta so the reindeer could rest up for their big work day. It, may, it makes sense. I would yeah. have done the same thing. You don't want to wear them out the week of <laughs> no, Christmas. So. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. Santa had the full outfit. He had the beard, the hat, the red suit, even bushy white eyebrows. But there was also a bit of a Jesse James twist to this Santa. He was wearing a trench coat over his Santa outfit. <laughs> And he was carrying a silver-plated revolver. This is no Santa that I know of. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like this cowboy Santa. I like the trench coat. I, never, I know. I've never seen that. Uh, so uh, this isn't a joke. Stand back, he told the guard as he aimed the revolver at the guard's head. The guard complied, handing over the two bags. Santa rushed back to the Jetta, which had a driver and was ready to go. And they took off. On December 21st, 1988, the headline on the front page of the Hartford Current would boldly read, Bogus Santa Steals $700,000. It would also detail that a witness saw what was happening and followed the getaway car. Not only did he get the full license plate, which was not registered to the North Pole, he told <laughs> authorities that Santa removed his outfit during the drive and he had a description of both men. Unfortunately, he lost their car on Interstate 84. In terms of it being the perfect crime, you have to give Santa some credit. The bank near a mall, like literally it's like freestanding and there's a mall that kind of wraps around it. Oh my gosh. And it was during the week leading up to Christmas. They were likely handling a ton of cash. If there was a time of year to hit them, that was probably the prime time. Thankfully, no shots fired. No injuries reported at all. However, there were a few slips. By removing his costume in the car, not realizing they were being followed, a composite sketch of him would be released the following day. Of course, they, there was also that problem with the license plate. When investigators ran the plate, they found out the plate had been stolen, but not the entire car. FBI agents worked on tracking down every brown Jetta in the state, that led agents directly to a man who was leasing a brown Jetta, Jeffrey Stenner. Oh, good grief. For the amount of effort and like success he seemed to have had like in his <laughs> robbery, like right. the, <laughs> these small right. things that just take these people down. Yeah, yeah. It's the so brown fascinating Jetta. to see. The brown Jetta. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they get to Jeffrey Stenner, they speak to his employees at bankers and they hear that, you know, things really hadn't been going too well. The restaurant wasn't paying its bills, including its employees payroll. That is until after December 20th, when all of a sudden everyone was being paid in wads of cash. Common sense here, folks. If you're going to be a ding dong enough to steal money, don't immediately start handing people wads of cash within days. Yeah, it's really, there's an aspect to this guy where you wonder, I mean, he seems to execute things kind of decently, but then yeah. there's these kind of details and loose Small ends. Things. Yeah. And the more I looked into him, the more I kind of got this um, description of his personality that like, even with his bars, he kind of liked to act like he was the godfather. Like, you know, he'd sit at a oh, table. Oh, geez, yeah. Yeah, and like order drinks for everyone and all that. So, um, yeah, someone I think that was probably caught up in appearances a little bit. But uh, on December 20th, 1989, so we're talking a full year, but exactly to the day after the Santa heist, Jeffrey's friend, employee, and occasional elf, Robert Schmidt, was found dead in a church parking lot, dumped in a snowbank. He was 26 years old, had been strangled to death. Jeffrey would receive $100,000 from a life insurance policy for Robert's death. And that's the same guy that he had working at the Loomis company for the first heist, the Loomis heist. Oh, my goodness. 
Over the course of the following years, both Zindis and bankers would shut down, leaving a trail of unpaid debts for each. In January of 1992, the FBI would finally catch up with Jeffrey Stenner. He was arrested and charged with the Santa heist, as well as the $1 million Loomis heist from 1987. Prosecutors struck a deal with Jeffrey. He agreed to plead guilty to both the Santa heist and the Loomis robbery. And in exchange, they dropped the charges for the Loomis robbery. Which oh, I just, wow. I know. I just, I can't believe some of these deals we hear, but yeah, they dropped all the charges for the first robbery. But just like the real Santa, Jeffrey had helpers. His guilty plea also included two accomplices, a friend and former cook at Bankers named Perfecto Valle. Interesting. Isn't that a cool name? <laughs> That's an interesting name. Who actually participated in the Loomis, Loomis robbery. He's one of the guys that mm -hmm. was armed in that robbery. And Jeffrey's now wife, Jill St. John, who not only held to that money, held on to it in her apartment like we had described before, but she was also laundering it at local banks. And there was a little detail in there. I didn't write into this, but they were very careful to try to keep the limit before below $10,000. Essentially, yeah. anything over 10000 would be noticed by the IRS. So mm -hmm. they would make these transactions and kind of keep it in like the $9,000 range. But oh, that's absolutely insane. Yeah. But once it was figured out, then it was just a matter of tracing the records. Exactly. And then they started seeing where all the money was. Uh, Jeffrey Stenner would be sentenced to 10 years in federal prison, more than the federal guidelines, because the judge thought Jeffrey had some of the stolen cash hidden somewhere waiting for his release. Jeffrey swears it was all spent. Um, they actually even had certain days where um, they were like bringing evidence into court about, look, mm -hmm. this proves that it's all gone. There's no way that he has any money left over. And kind of considering, you know, what was going on with his businesses and everything. Yeah. Did he have his money? Well, I mean, I wouldn't put it past him, though, to be really honest with you. Mm. I will say, uh, mm. Mm. are we going to get into that? Okay. Well, right. mm. <laughs> I did call this story Santa's vacation. We'll get to it. The time he was incarcerated uh, during his trial proceedings would be counted towards his sentence. So I think he was in jail for 14 or 16 months, if I remember right. So they would knock that off his yeah. sentence. And then with good behavior, he would get out a little early. Ultimately, he wound up serving about seven years total. But then, Danielle, something oh, no. very interesting happened soon after his release. I'm telling you, I get these feelings. I get these feelings and I know. I'm always <laughs> like, wait a minute. <laughs> yep, your instincts were right there. Even Santa needs a vacation, right? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I so he gets it. out of jail. <laughs> Jeff flew to France mm. for a year between 2000 and 2001. Wonder how he paid for that. I mean, definitely <laughs> not by trading his canteen stuff. Like, he, if he's trading his like Doritos at the, at the prison, I don't. He's getting any money for that. Yeah, so. no, I, I mean, don't I think have so. my speculations, but <laughs> yeah, maybe that judge wasn't so crazy. <laughs> Uh, when he returned, he moved to Arizona, married again, and uh, with a new baby, he was soon arrested for violating his probation. Seems that he didn't tell his probation officer about that little trip to France. How so, did it... What? Was, and he was on probation when he went. Yeah, he just right. left. So how on earth did nobody realize? <laughs> yeah, just left. <laughs> didn't talk to anyone, didn't tell anyone, hey, I'm going to go to France for a year. No, just took off. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so he winds up serving an additional six months. And as they're releasing him, literally, they're, you know, getting him set up to, mm -hmm. to get out. He was rearrested on a, quote, fugitive for justice warrant. And that was from back in Connecticut. He was extradited. And then Santa got a little gift of his own. He was charged with the murder of Robert Schmidt. Ultimately, it would be found several people were involved, but they said it was ordered by Jeffrey Stenner because Robert had been talking too much about the two armored truck robberies, and he may have even been talking to the authorities about one of them in particular. It's believed that Robert Schmidt was the getaway driver in the Santa heist, and of course, he was the guard working on the Loomis truck when that robbery occurred. In 2004, Jeffrey Stenner was convicted of being an accessory to murder and sentenced to 60 years in prison, the harshest sentence the judge could give him. He won't be eligible for release until he's 87 years old. One of Robert Schmidt's brothers, Keith, gave Jeff some stern words at the sentencing. 
All your schemes have resulted in a prison uniform. Incarceration is your final triumph. How lonely and small and insignificant you seem today, Jeff. The very solution you used to solve the Robert Schmidt problem has become the catalyst to your demise. Looks like Stenner has traded his red suit for an orange one. Thank you to the Hartford Courant for their excellent coverage of all aspects of this case over numerous years and Wikipedia. I read like, oh man, there has to be 20 articles here um, from the Hartford Courant and just all the different ways that this case kind of spun out. You know, you had, of course, the robberies, uh, which they gave really good details, they even had like maps of, you know, the getaway and stuff. Um, but then they got into the Robert Schmidt murder and then that's a whole different chain that kind of breaks off. And there's articles just about that as that's being investigated and then tied back to Jeffrey Stenner. I I mean, there's, there's so many different elements here. So many different separate crimes that somehow still kind of directly tied to each other. That's a lot to follow. Yeah. It's, it's like a spider web kind of, um, but thankfully they did such excellent coverage. I was able to to track it all down on newspapers.com and read through a bunch of old newspapers for that. But what do you think of Jeffrey Stenner? Um, I'm going to get to that. But first, I also need to say thank you to New York Daily News. They had the most insane article about my story, as well as an article done by Wide Open Country, which I had never heard of before. But man, they nailed it. Now, now awesome. that I've forgotten that and I'm adding it in. Yep. Holy, sm- holy smokes. That's like the best way I can describe it. Probably the most interesting thing to me, actually. Well, one of the things is how he immediately says, as he jumps out in a Santa suit, this isn't a joke. <laughs> yeah. No if that gathering has to of be kids. your like first statement. Right. When you're jumping out with your choice of disguise, it's probably not the right one. Do you think that's why he put the trench coat on so you know it's a serious it, Santa? That, that's exactly I'm telling you. He seems very like insecure, like him switching wives all the time and then yeah. his different different, you know, crimes that he acted out, how he acted towards Schmidt talking to people he seems so insecure and it even shows in his santa costume and then him putting a trench coat on on top of it that's yeah. very fascinating to me yeah and the whole thing with uh, the death of robert schmidt really starts becoming like a like a gangster film type thing i mean there's four other guys that are involved yeah. this guy you know was um p- wanted to pay these guys to do it but they were up and coming and they were young and they just wanted respect in the organization yeah. so they were going to do it for free and you know obviously i didn't want to get into the details of of what happened during that yeah. actual murder but there the whole thing about him trying to like emulate being a godfather really plays out and really gets pushed to the limits when it comes to the robert uh, Schmidt uh, angle on this story as well. I know it really. I mean, it really does. It makes you think, like what what reality was he actually living in? Because it does yeah. seem like he has this touch of feeling almost invincible. I mean, yeah. I understand. You know, some people progress in their crimes. They may start with you know simple stealing or things like that, and then they right. go up and up and up from there. But I feel like he he was pretty set and content with his robberies and everything like that but and then all of a sudden he's paying people yeah to murder someone that's crazy it is it seemed almost like he was living his own kind of story of how he wanted his life to go and he wanted his life to be and he just kind of arranged the pieces if they didn't fit quite right for his own personal liking yeah that's insane there seems to be something super deep in that yeah i think there's also a decent statement in there just um about the incarceration and that really it's weird because the order is kind of out of place you know yeah robert is killed just a year after the actual heist and then of course the fbi doesn't catch up with him for like i think almost three years after yeah. that wow. so when you think about the incarceration there it's almost like he never really had a chance to be taught the lesson of oh maybe this isn't a lifestyle i should go down anymore you know? not at all you know he puts seven years into jail comes back out <laughs> goes flies to flies to france <laughs> He's just like, you know what? This has all been too much for me. I need to take a vacation. Yeah, I need a vacation. <laughs> and, and his lawyers even terrible. said, yeah, his lawyers even said part of the reason why he came back is because he knew that he was being investigated for the Schmidt murder, which yeah. I don't know if I believe or not. I would think what most likely happened was he probably did have a nest egg left over somewhere that he oh, took yeah. and he went to France. I think he probably blew it all. I mean, oh, absolutely. If, yeah, just based on the pattern that we're seeing mm-hmm. here of him having to keep the robberies going to keep his business businesses afloat, he's not someone that is great at 
financial planning, I guess you would say, which no. is crazy because he was in the banking industry. <laughs> I know. Um, but yeah, yeah, interesting dude. Oh my gosh. Well, also too, thinking about it, I doubt he came back for that either because if he's going to hire someone, you know, and be a part of a plan to kill this man. Yeah. For speaking to someone you know, and I don't even know if he knew what he said. I, I doubt he's coming back from France unless he absolutely has to. That's what you I know, said. If he knows he's being investigated. I just don't believe that for a second. Yeah. If he knows he can't afford any lifestyle out there, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to yeah. try to come back and, you know, put some new life together. And I don't think it's weird because when you think about owning bars and restaurants and stuff like that, it's like, OK, well, he's got to be into work. I mean, yeah. he's buying these businesses and even if he does like hanging out and sitting at the table and looking like a big shot, there's got to be an aspect to him that actually enjoys, you know, trying to make these things successful. But it seems like he was just more caught up in making the crimes successful and then just having to do an unending chain of those to keep his lifestyle. I don't know. How do you I'm ever work out of that? It's I don't I don't know either, but I'm, I'm telling you, I feel like he. I'm sure he did enjoy some aspect of the businesses and all of that, but yeah. I'm still so stuck on the idea that he expected things to be a certain way mm -hmm. and he, not like he felt necessarily entitled to them, but he, I don't know, he's given me this weird vibe where I feel like he just enjoyed it because he, he thought it was going to go a certain way or be a certain way. And every time it didn't, he freaked out, but then he'd be content for a second because he had all this money and he had everything he needed yeah. and he could go and sit and be a boss and look the way he wants to look like, oh man, that's... Yeah. I'm glad nobody got hurt other, well, other than Schmidt. I know he got hurt, but yeah, I feel yeah. like with that many... Intense robberies and that much money. It could have been a lot worse. It could worse. have been a lot worse. Yeah, a whole definitely. lot worse. Definitely. Well, as usual, we have some extra stories, little tidbits that we looked into that we want to share with you guys. Danielle's going to start with one from The Independent in the United Kingdom. And we are really bringing things down a level because those were two kind of more intense stories. And the next yeah. couple that we're going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, we're lightening I've, things I've up been, a little bit. I've been laughing about these for days. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know how Santa is known for climbing down chimneys and leaving Christmas presents? Mm -hmm. Well, apparently, he can also climb pretty well through a Kentucky Fried Chicken drive through window. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm telling you, I don't know how. But he can also pull out a knife, take all the money, and said KFC. And this is exactly what happened at a KFC in the UK in December of 2015. Now, luckily, the restaurant was closed. No employees were hurt. Another good ending to a story. Yes. Uh, police even released a video of the incident trying to get the Santa nabbed. And if you're watching the YouTube version, you are seeing that right now. And from what I know, he's not been caught. Um, Am I no, right? I don't think he has been. No. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I think for, oh, one of these, the Santa has been caught. But yeah, actually, there was a lot of cases I looked into where the Santa was still on the run. Basically, the costume aspect works. How does this? Yeah. It's so hard to identify the person. It's um, mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. And it is weird seeing Santa crawl through a drive through window. So that's why we're going to be sure to <laughs> run that oh, video. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Where is my chicken? <laughs> I came with an empty sack. Now fill it up. Uh, this one comes from Thomson Reuters. This took place in 2015. Brazilian police are hunting for a Sao Paulo Santa Claus who kicked off the Christmas shopping season by stealing a helicopter. The thief rented the aircraft at the Campo Marte airport in Sao Paulo. During the flight, the Santa forced the pilot to fly to a small farm. Uh, and there they were met up by a third person. The pilot was tied up and then the two perpetrators flew away. After several hours, the pilot managed to escape and alert police. But Santa or the helicopter still have not been found. I know. And that story absolutely blew my mind. Yeah, how do you steal a helicopter? That's insane. Like, I don't know. don't and helicopters what? have transponders like airplanes do, or some way to trace them or something? That's just that's what I would assume, and I just I find it so ironic <laughs> and like hilarious. Like you're you're in a Santa Claus costume. Yeah, I mean the jokes that I want to make out of that alone. <laughs> I, know, I know. It's like oh my gosh, isn't there this one movie where Santa Claus? Yeah, it has to be. It's, I think it's one of the actual The Santa Claus movies, but it's like a newer one 
mm-hmm. where I think Jack Frost takes over or something like that. I don't know. Either way, they like upgrade the North Pole. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I yeah. feel like this story fits in perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Santa needs a helicopter. Speaking of which, <laughs> um, maybe this will be a tip off to Brazilian police. He could He could have the helicopter in the North Pole. You never maybe, know. Maybe they need to look. I mean, he might have wanted a different method of travel. Maybe yeah. something's wrong with the reindeer. There's no telling. <laughs> now, the next one is from the Denver Post, and it's my personal favorite. <laughs> yeah, this one's interesting because everything we've covered so far has been a robbery of some kind. Exactly. This one is kind of the flip of that. Exactly. Seaside, California. Santa showed up. At, well, it does involve a restaurant. Yeah. At a Buffalo Wild Wings. Mm-hmm. He walked around the restaurant giving customers and employees a special gift wrapped in paper napkins. They were finding a different type of Christmas tree inside of these napkins. <laughs> what do you think this man was passing out, John? <laughs> um, I, You know, I'm the old guy on the show. I don't know what you're talking about, you young whippersnappers. <laughs> With your smoking trees? Exactly. Oh, my goodness. This man was handing out marijuana what? wrapped up in napkins. What? And actually, a lot of people were trying to figure out what was going on, and they were taken back by this. And even the employees were trying to figure out what was happening for a while. But the straw that broke the camel's back is when he filled their entire tip jar oh my God. up with marijuana. Oh, my God. <laughs> And at this point, they're like, eh, maybe this isn't a great thing to be happening. So they called authorities. When cops showed up and arrested him, they found two pounds of pot on Randy. How would we say the last name? Lange? Probably Lange, Lange I think. Yeah. Lange. See, I'm way off. Yeah. He was dressed up as St. Nick, giving out two, <laughs> two pounds <laughs> on it. him. And that's after he'd been given a bunch out. I know. Oh, my goodness. And I'm pretty sure they even went back to his home and they found more. Oh, man. <laughs> So that Santa Claus, I mean, he was at least giving. Yeah. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think you're supposed to. And after all these to. stories. <laughs> well, and in Denver, it's legal, right? I mean, marijuana is mm-hmm. legal in Colorado, I'm sure. But um, I still don't think it's a good thing to be <laughs> ending it out willy nilly in a Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> probably not the best best choice. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. But I'm glad that lightened things up just a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyways. <laughs> Who do you guys think is going to win this month? Audience, you guys are the ones that get to vote. It is all in your hands. Who had the best Santa Claus crime story? I almost think we should call it like Santa Claus gangsters or something. There I was, know. There, these were both kind of serious, big, like action movie gangster stories. I know. Wow. Neither of them seem like they're actually real. I, can't, yeah. I remember reading through mine to kind of speak it back to Powell to make sure the flow was right and everything was good. And I was like, this sounds like it's a movie. I know. <laughs> like, this doesn't sound real. I'm going to have to look into it. I'm surprised that that one wouldn't have been a movie. Yeah. Well, there's a whole book on it. Okay. I don't I don't know if there's a movie. It would make an interesting one, but I do know there is a whole entire book on it. Yeah, yeah. Well, on the next episode coming January 1st, 2020, We've got a very interesting topic and a big thank you to Becky Geiger for suggesting this. We had a little competition over on Patreon. Uh, she earned herself a signed copy of one of DB Tuber, Anthio, Anthony Curcio's children's books. And that was for suggesting the topic of birth year crimes. And what that means is for Danielle's birth year and my birth year, we have to pick a crime from that specific year. So for me, that's going to be 1975. And for Danielle, 1992. (laughs) Really? Is it? For some reason, I thought it was 88. No. (laughs) 92. Wow. You make me feel like a baby every time I tell someone that. Well, I mean, I might have been graduating high school the following year. (laughs) But this should make it so fascinating. I'm honestly yes. very interested. And this is a wide pool to you guys. We've got a decent, you know, amount of crimes to choose from. It's not a very specific topic. So Yeah, I don't think we're going to hit topics that are as close like as we did in this episode. Yeah. Um, and for me personally, I'm going to try to look for some, something that seems culturally relevant to that yeah. era. That's a good um, idea. You know, like the disco caper of 1970. Oh, my goodness. Just, I'm going to try to find some crime that, you know, is a bit unique because of the time period. But uh, we'll see if I'm successful or not. Yeah, oh I think either way, it's going to be great. But It should be good. Yeah. But 
if you guys would like to see more of us until then, you can find us all over social media. We each have YouTube channels and things like Twitter. And well, I have an Instagram. You can find me. I'm too despite- old for Instagram. <laughs> You can find me by just <laughs> looking up Danielle Hallen. I think on some of my accounts, it's Danielle Hallen YT. I still haven't figured that out. It's been a year. Hang in there with me. <laughs> yep. And you can find all my stuff. The easiest place is just to go to www.lordandarts.com. And I've got links to everything from there. And if you have ideas you'd like to submit to Crime After Crime or you just want to say hi, you can email us at crimeaftercrime at lordandarts.com or talk to us on Twitter at crimeafterpod. Crime and cr- crime and crime, apparently. <laughs> We're changing our name. Yeah, Happy that's New it. Year. New, new <laughs> Year, new us. <laughs> crime After Crime <laughs> is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And as always, we want to say a huge thank you to our patrons. Our patrons, you guys, all of y'all are absolutely amazing. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment every month. And I say this every single time. We have the most fun over there. John and I constantly ask each other questions that kind of push us out of our box. You get to know us a little bit more. You get to know the embarrassing things that I've done, which is a lot of stuff. (laughs) It's true. I can say that's true. (laughs) It is a good time. Plus, new patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special which is always cool. Absolutely. If you've enjoyed today's show, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. And the best way that you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. And do not forget, we also have a merch store. So you guys can visit teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash crime after crime. You guys can get some fun merch from us. We've got our coffee cups. Me and John have to share them technically. Yeah, we can only afford one between the two of us, but you can buy your own. (laughs) Exactly. So don't miss out on that. And that's it for us today. So we will see you guys next time on Crime After Crime. Happy holidays. We'll see you in 2020.